Well, good morning. Welcome to worship on this sixth Sunday of Easter. I saw the countdown going. I'm like, is it already that close to 10 o'clock? And it was. <laughs> I lost track of time. Well, welcome to worship. It's good to see you. I know a lot of our folks are on vacations in various places this week. So I am so excited all of you are here. Let me invite you, if you aren't already planning to, or you don't catch the smells coming out of the basement, to join us following worship for our stewardship meal. And it's just a potluck to, to celebrate the things we do that um, showing ways that we are already being good stewards of all that God has entrusted to us, and just a chance to eat together and share stories and to remember together. So please come and join us. There will be enough food downstairs um, immediately after this. Anything else folks need to know about it, Marcia? Okay. Oh, yes, please. So, yeah, Marsh, um, just for those folks who were online with us and could not hear Marsha, great thanks to folks who came out and helped at the community garden. Yesterday was a work day um, to care for the land that God has entrusted to us out there. So thanks for everybody who showed up. Got a lot done, more to do, as there's always more to do when it comes to gardens. Um, so thank you. Yeah, it was raining on like Thursday and Friday, and it was like, oh. And yesterday was perfect. God is good. I don't have any other little notes that I've made for myself, but are there things you would like to share as we gather this morning? Well, then I would invite you to take just a few moments and to prepare your hearts for worship. Just as God's work of creation never ends, so the gifts received in baptism are renewed every day. Let us give thanks together for life, the life given us in baptism. In the waters of baptism, we have passed over from death to life with Jesus Christ, and we are a new creation. For this saving mystery, for this water, let us bless God who was, who is, and who is to come, we thank you, O oh God, for your river of life, flowing freely from your throne through the earth, through this city and country alike, through every living thing. You rescued Noah and his family from the flood. You opened wide the sea for the Israelites. Now in these waters you flood us with mercy, and our sin is drowned forever. You open the gates of righteousness, and we pass through safely. In Jesus Christ, you calm the troubled waters. You nourish us and enclose us in safety. You call us forth and send us out. In lush and barren places, you are with us. You have become our salvation. Now breathe upon this water and awaken your church once more. Claim us again as your beloved and holy people. Quench our thirst. Cleanse our hearts. Wipe away every tear. To you, our beginning and our end, our shepherd and our lamb, be honor and glory, praise and thanksgiving, now and forever. Amen. I'm going to take just a few moments for um, to be with our kids. I know we have one here, but I don't want to put you on the line, so you can just stay right there and help me maybe from there. But for those who are joining us online, welcome. Just have a couple things. Did you notice anything strange around here this morning? Okay, other than me, I know. But I love some, some things up here. I don't know if you can see them. Because I need your help helping me think about what these all have in common. I have a golden retriever. Now, I know you might think that's a dog. It's not. <laughs> see, it says the golden retriever. So I got one of these pinchy things. 
I guess I could come and attack the TV. Okay, maybe not. That wouldn't be nice. Okay, so keep my golden retriever in mind. Maybe you saw this back here. My little smiley face. It's called a scrub daddy. And you can use it to scrub things. And you can stick spoons through there and round things through there. And the coolest thing is when it's either in cold water or like now, it's really hard, but you put it in hot water and it gets all soft and squishy. That's what you can scrub with it. Throw one other thing. You see these up here? Brought them this morning. Now they may look just like regular gloves. Okay, really long regular gloves. <laughs> but I brought my gloves this morning. Any idea what I do with these gloves? That's right, they're to handle things that are hot. Oven mitts, though I like that they're not mitts because I like to move my fingers. But these also have something really cool. See the white stuff there? It's silicone, it's grippy stuff. So I can pick up things and I don't have to worry about dropping them. Or if I'm trying to open a jar, they'll grip on to the jar handles and help me turn them. My gloves. So question, okay, you've seen my three weird things. My scrub daddy, my gloves, and my golden retrieve. Any idea what they have to do with one another? I'm hearing all sorts of noise around here. I think they may have figured it out. They help you do stuff. This helps you pick up things. I love this when I drop something behind the washer and dryer. Because then I don't have to pull the silly things out of the little cubby hole. I can just kind of reach across and go, and then get that sock. You ever lose a sock behind a dryer? I can get it with this. And this helps me scrub things clean, whether it's in, I need hot water or cold water. And this helps me get stuff out of the oven without burning my hands. These are just some of the helper things that I found as I was looking around my house. And it got me thinking about what Jesus promised his followers. We're going to read it in the gospel text today. He says he's going to send an advocate, a paraclete, a helper to be with us. We call that the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit that is with us teaches us things. Help we, helps us know that God loves us and helps us learn and grow as Jesus' disciples. Doesn't mean we don't have stuff to do, like I still have to grab my old helper, the golden retriever. I still have to physically rip the junk out of the oven. But with that help, I can do it and do it better than what I could and do it safely. And I think about the Holy Spirit teaching us, teaching us and being with us through all of this stuff so that we know, we know we are safe in God's arms and that Jesus loves us no matter what and even will pray for us. Because sometimes we don't know what to say and we just have to say, God, help! And the Holy Spirit says, I got this one. So maybe as you listen this morning, you think about the helpers in your home. You remember the Holy Spirit that Jesus said is going to be with us always so that we will know of his love. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for telling us that the Holy Spirit would be with us when you went back to heaven. Thank, thank you, you for, for that, that advocate, that paraclete, that spirit, that advocate that loves us just as you loved us. us that helps us to know all things and to grow in our faith to you. And thank you for the helpers in our life, the people, the things that you've brought. Let us be your helpers to others who need and 
Allow us to feel your Holy Spirit so that we will always know of your love. Thank you, Jesus, we pray in your name. Amen. We join in our opening hymn, and I invite you to stand as you were able. Sunday of Easter, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The risen Christ lives among us, calling us to be a blessing. The risen Christ lives among us, calling us to be a blessing. The risen Christ lives among us, calling us to be a blessing, calling us to be disciples to the world, blessed, healed, and filled with joyous good news. We sing together in praise, the song, Praise to the Lord, the Almighty. Thank you. 
Let us pray. Bountiful God, you gather your people into your realm, and you promise us food from your tree of life. Nourish us with your word, that empowered by your spirit, we may love one another and the world you have made. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you to be seated. The first reading is from Acts chapter 16, verses 9 through 15. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia pleading with him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace, the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be a faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. Word of God, word of life. God. Our psalm is Psalm 67. We'll read it responsibly. May God be merciful to us and bless us. May the light of God's face shine upon us. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has brought forth its increase. God, our own God, has blessed us. May God give us blessing. And may all the ends of the earth stand in awe. The second reading is from Revelation chapters 21 and 22. And in the Spirit, one of the angels carried me away to a great high mountain, and showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. I saw no temple in the city, for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God is its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day and there will be no night there. People will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. But nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life, with its twelve kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. Nothing accursed will be found there any more, but the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads, and there will be no more night. The need of... Then they need no light of lamp or sun, for the Lord God will be their light, and they will reign forever and ever. Word of God, word of life.
gospel according to St. John, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus answered Judas, not Iscariot, those who love me will keep my word, and my Father will love them, and he will come to them and make our home with them. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but is from the Father who sent me. I have said these things to you while I am still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled, and do not let them be afraid. You heard me say to you, I am going away, and I am coming to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice that I am going to the Father, because the Father is greater than I. And now I have told you this before it occurs, so that when it does occur, you may believe. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated. I'm not sure if I'm excited to preach today or intimidated. Let me explain. As you might remember from last week's announcements, I have spent this last week at the Festival of Homiletics, a week-long conference on breaching. And even though it was held in person in Denver, I chose to forego the cost of travel and lodging and food and, 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 and I attended the conference online from my home office, also known as my dining room table. And after five days filled with preachers and workshops, it kind of feels like a different pulpit this morning. Just to give you some fair warning, most of the preachers I listened to this week were people of color and came out of the AME, UCC, or Baptist. So if somewhere in the middle of this I say, can I get an amen, hallelujah? You'll understand. I'll try to control myself. And if you feel like talking back in the middle of it, I'll understand that too. Even online we were talking during the sermons. One thing I did discover in listening to probably close to 20 sermons in the last um, five days is that I'm not the only preacher being drawn to the Revelation text during this Easter season. Now i got to admit, I kind of feel guilty when... I don't necessarily hear this spirit calling me to the gospel text, but I've made peace with that. When you stop and think about it, though, maybe reading Revelation and reading about John's vision is exactly what we need these days. John's community has been torn apart not only by the Roman Empire, but also by the ultra-conservative religious leaders who saw Jesus as a threat to everything, including their faith. Religion and empire became deadly bedfellows for the Jews as well as Jesus' followers. John saw the temple destroyed, friends die, his way of life being torn apart, character assassinated, and been basically convicted of treason, and now he's exiled. You know, get rid of those troublemakers so the rest of us can live in peace. Does any of that sound familiar? John hasn't had a couple good years here. But we know that. We've had some rough times, rougher than probably most of us could have ever imagined. And we're not quite done yet if statistics and trends can be trusted. So perhaps this is a great year to be reading Revelation and to look at the vision that God gave to John. Because you see, it's not just for John. It's for God's people whenever they are facing a time when it feels as though the very earth is shattering beneath their feet, when it feels like everything you know you could count on no longer exists or is shifting so rapidly that, that you, you can't, can't get, get a grip, grip on it. it. It's for God's people who cry out, not just in the middle of the night, 
But in the heat of the day, God, don't you see? Can't you stop this? It's for God's people who feel exiled in so many different ways. It's for God's people today, here and now. So what's God's word to us today in John's vision? Well, it starts on that high mountain that the angel brings him to. And he sees sacred space, the temple coming down to earth. We don't work our way to heaven into God's holy space. That is God's work, God coming to us. And God does it in a way that we can at least recognize. Even though it looks different because technically there's no temple, John felt the familiarness of it. So much so that he could see Jesus was the temple incarnate. Holy space doesn't always look like what we think it should. Sometimes those spaces change. And sometimes we have to stretch to even catch a glimpse of God at work in them. They may not be as familiar as we'd like. I mean, who knew that couches and dining room tables could be sanctuaries and altars? But make no mistake, God is present in them, making each space holy for a time, for us, holy. Do you see it? Do you feel it? John sees something else and comes to realize that this vision isn't just for him. God's work is for the nations. And those gates, they don't keep people out. They are open all the time. There is no St. Peter making a list, checking it twice, and keeping people out. But what those gates do do is that they keep out all that has plagued creation from the beginning, what John calls an abomination or unclean. Those things we use to differentiate between people all the isms of our day. You know those words that are, roll off of our tongues and off of our news? The racism and classism and fascism and ableism and sexism and ageism and nationalism and isms we haven't even come up with yet that keep piling on. And we wonder, will there ever be a time when they won't be on our minds or in our hearts or, or lead innocent people to be killed? Yes. God reveals to John. God has a way of taking care of the falsehoods we cling to and make so much out of. And in the holiness of God, all those are stripped away. And we can stand in the glory of God together. We need to hear that God has the wisdom and power to de deal with the divisiveness that we see. And even though we created them, so make no mistake, they are not of God. Even though we created them, we're not left to clean them up on our own. In Jesus Christ, that lamb who is on the throne, he is, if you will, that uber, ultra, greater than any HEPA filter you can come up with, the one who cleanses and restores and makes whole so that we can together gather in God's presence. Oh, Lord Jesus, may that day and that clean, cleansing come quickly, because we are so tired of the fighting and the hatred. And there's one other part of John's vision that's been grabbing me as I've sat with these texts this week. It is that tree of life that's on both sides of the river, now, not only does it have 12 kinds of fruit, and I like to imagine that one month it's filled with cherries and the next month it's filled with peaches. Love peaches. And another month there's got to be avocados because how can it be heaven without guacamole? The other nine months, you know, whatever. Kind of partial to mangoes and peaches, or fat mangoes and pears, but, you know. But the leaves... The leaves grab my attention. They're not for decoration or to keep coolness 
or to catch the rain. No, they are for the healing of the nations. Let me say that again, the healing of the nations. And don't we need to know that? To remind it that our God has the power and resources to bring healing. Each week as we gather for worship, we pray for people. Why? Do we really think that it's going to make any difference? Do we do it just because, well, it helps us feel like we're doing something in a situation we can't control? Why do we pray for people? I trust it's because we believe God's word. Not only where we're told to bring all of our concerns before God and to pray without ceasing, but this vision of John. That God has the power and resources to bring healing. We need to hear it again and again. The leaves are for the healing of the nations. When we pray for Betty Belling, and I'm using her as an example because I knew they weren't going to be here today. They're at a graduation, so I didn't want to embarrass her. And plus, it's already gone out on the prayer chain, so I'm not breaking confidentiality. But when we pray for Betty and for the surgery she's having on Tuesday, we need to be assured that God hears that prayer and will bring healing in one way or another. That God has the power to be present with that surgeon who will practice the art of healing. And that she's not alone as she goes through it. And that we might have hope that our God has the power to take over everything that would threaten to bring us down. Every day I deal with pain. And if I didn't believe that God could still work through me and that somehow God would give me the strength and power and conviction and, yes, grace to do what I'm called to do, I wouldn't even get out of bed. And let me tell you, there have been those days when staying in bed seemed like the greatest idea in the world. But then I hear again, the leaves are for the healing of the nations. And I know that God is with me. And I look around this room, and I know some of your stories, and I know the struggles that you deal with and what you're carrying on your heart. It's hard, and it's real. And I know there are many situations I know nothing about, but that doesn't diminish them. To each of you, hear God's word. The leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. I know that includes you. God has the power and resources to heal you in the way God knows is best. It may not look like what you want, may be different than what you anticipate, but know it is from God. A quick story. At my church in Denver, there was this young teenage girl in our youth group, and she loved to hike, loved hiking in the mountains like so many around here do. And one of the times when she was out hiking, she got a tick bite. Now you'd think, no big deal, because I know probably most people in this room have had a tick bite at one time or another. But this time, it gave a Rocky Mountain spotted tick fever, and she nearly died. She spent years close to paralyzed, and everything she'd once counted on was lost. She'd grown up in the church, so she prayed and prayed for God to heal her. And after about a year of her and our church praying that way, she heard the Holy Spirit tell her no and lead her in a different direction. With the blessing of our pastor, who actually happened to be the former bishop of our synod, she became a nun and went into specialized ministry of prayer and healing. She did experience some relief, but she never got full healing. And last time I checked in on her status, she talked about how her room was filled with letters and cards and drawings from people she had prayed for or who had a prayer ministry with and how God had healed them and given them the courage to face what was before them. Through prayer, 
God had healed her spirit and the bodies, minds, and souls of hundreds of others. That's the thing about God. It's not all about us. It's about the nations, all of us together. Even as our psalmist acknowledges, it's about God saving health for the nation. And for that, let the nations be glad and sing for joy. And so for today, for Easter, I'm sticking with, I'm sticking with Revelation, trusting that even now the Spirit, the Advocate, the Helper, the one Jesus promised, is leading me and all of us into truth, teaching us what we need to know today, here and now. Speak, Lord, for your servants are listening. Please pray with me. Renewing God, your promises are bold, so extravagant we can hardly believe them. Thank you for showing us, for reminding us that you are a God of power and resources whose love changes the nations, changes us. Send your powerful healing upon all who feel exiled, who need deliverance, reassurance, strength. To those who've given up, who want to exclude, who somehow feel the need to fight in order to feel right. Pour your life-giving water from that river of life over our world and claim us anew. Thank you for the hope and the courage to face another day. We ask all things, O oh God, as they're in accord with your will, as we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
As we share our faith this day using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. We turn our hearts to prayer, praying for the world and all who are in need. God of new life, open your church to the unexpected ways of your Spirit is at work. Guide all church leaders in their visioning, partnership, and planning. Surround us with your peace. God, in your mercy. God of creation, give a vision of increase and abundant harvest for farmers, laborers, and gardeners who are just beginning this growing season. Join their efforts with the goodness of creation to feed all living things. God, in your mercy, God of knowledge, shine your light of wisdom and peace among nations. When those in power seek to assert dominance over others, confound their ways and make them yield to your humble authority and wisdom. God, in your mercy, God of deliverance, give safe haven to those who seek healing, liberation, or peace. Create places filled with hospitality where hurting people find your loving presence and wholeness. Hear our voices as we pray for your healing, for Betty and Paul, for Patricia and Dennis, Diane, Rodney, Alan, Steve, Lynn, Jess, Chuck and Donna, for Karen and Jenny, Kinsey and Bob, and so many others on our hearts. God in your mercy. God of the nations, uphold the work and ministries and organizations who assist people experiencing homelessness, citizens returning from prison, and all marginalized people wherever it is they call home. Accomplish your work, your will, through our efforts. God in your mercy. God of inclusion. Assemble your people at rivers, streams, and fonts where we remember our baptism and welcome others into the communion of saints. Gather us with those who have died when we meet together at your river of life. God, in your mercy. 
In your mercy, O God, hear these our prayers and renew us by your life-giving spirit through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. I would invite you to share a sign of peace in a way you and those around you are most comfortable. invite you to stand as you were able. Let us pray. Living God, you gather the wolf and the lamb to feed together in your peaceable reign, and you welcome us all at your table. Reach out to us through this meal and show us your wounded and risen body, that we may be nourished and believe in Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Most righteous God, we remember in this supper the perfect sacrifice offered once by our Lord Jesus Christ for the sins of the whole world. As he took bread, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Your death, Lord Jesus, we proclaim. Your resurrection we celebrate. Your coming in glory we await. Send your Holy Spirit upon us, the bread that we break and the cup that we bless. Grant that, being joined to Christ in communion, we may be joined to each other in the unity of faith. Come, Holy Spirit. As grains of wheat have been gathered from many fields into one loaf and grapes from many hills into one cup, Grant, O Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The things of God for the gathered people of God. Come, taste and see that the Lord is good. 
by the congregation to be seated. I would invite you to our table through the center aisle this day. I will serve you bread in your hand. And then I invite you to pick up a cup with either wine or grape juice, whichever you're most comfortable with. The grape juice is the lighter colored liquid in the center of each tray. And then take that cup with you and place it in the containers on the far end of the pews as you return to your seats by the aisles. All of our communion elements are gluten-free for those of you for whom that is an issue. This is Christ's table, and all, all the nations, you, are invited to come and die.
going to invite you to stand as you were able. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. We give you thanks, generous God, for in this bread and cup we have tasted the new heaven and earth where hunger and thirst are no more. Send us from this table as witnesses to the resurrection that through our lives all may know life in Jesus' name. Amen. God, the author of life, Christ, the living cornerstone and the life-giving spirit of adoption, bless you now and always. Amen. We close singing together, O oh God, our help in ages past.